Hi, Michelle Glass here. Welcome to our first episode in our chapter 27, lecture 27 series, and our topic for this video is water balance. Now for water to be in balance, that means that the water lost is equal to the water that is gained, or of course you could have written this, the gains are equal to the losses. When we talk about water in the body, we have two distinct water or fluid compartments. Fluid is a better word, right, because water just is talking about water, whereas fluid is talking about the liquid and everything that's dissolved. We already know about our extracellular fluid, our ECF. This includes your interstitial fluid as well as your plasma. Those are going to be the two primary components. But then you also have smaller compartments of extracellular fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, lymph, synovial fluid, serous fluid, so that's going to be that fluid in between body cavities, the endolymph and perilymph of the inner ear, aqueous humor, uh, so all of these are included in the um, fluid compartment ECF. And then the other compartment would be the ICF or intracellular fluid, and this done is the fluid inside of the cell, so another name for that is the cytosol. Now these fluids have different compositions. So we're gonna see the ECF has ions such as ion, um, sodium chloride and um, bicarbonate ion, that's the HCO3 minus. Whereas the ICF is going to have potassium, magnesium, and phosphate ions. So we do see that these fluids are kept separate from the cell membrane, and we do see the compositions of the fluids are different, um, but we do have free movement of water across the membrane. Now, remember water is polar, and so it's gonna slowly move uh, through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane, but it will move. Um, and so for this reason, we see that when we have water imbalance, that we have an equal osmolarity between the ECF and the ICF. Um, even though we have different compositions across the membrane. Now the water is moving um, to create that equal osmolarity. So all of those principles of osmosis will apply, meaning water follows the solute. So wherever you have a higher concentration of water, that's good, excuse me, wherever you have a higher concentration of solute, that's gonna be the direction that the water moves. When we're thinking about the fluid in the body, we can consider that about one third of the body's fluid is in the extracellular fluid, and about two thirds is inside of the cell. Now, the fluid inside of the cell is being regulated by the cell itself. So we um, very often see that the differences that show up in the extracellular fluid are going to be the ones that trigger the homeostatic mechanisms. So we're going to have receptors in the plasma in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid that are going to detect changes such as osmolarity um, in order to initiate homeostatic mechanisms. And we don't really see that in the ICF because the cell itself is going to regulate the composition of the cytosol. When we are looking at those receptors in the plasma and the CSF, um, we are looking at two factors, not just osmotic concentration, but also the plasma volume. So we've talked before about hormones being released to adjust blood volume so that we can see an adjustment in blood pressure. Osmosis is a passive process, remember, so we're going to have automatic movement of water across the cell membrane, either in or out, depending on the differences in the um, osmotic gradient. But we can see cells actively transporting sodium, and in this way, they can help to, um, you know, have some active control over osmosis. It's a good thing to remember that water is going to follow salt. So wherever the salt goes, um, remember that's going to change the osmolarity or the, the solute concentration. And so we're going to see water flowing um, to areas of high salt or high solute concentration. When we're talking about the extracellular fluid being in balance again, you know, we're talking about our gains equaling our losses. And there's lots of well, there's a few sources for water in the body and there's a few ways that we lose water in the body, but primarily we're talking about the amount of fluid that you're taking in 
through the diet should be equal to the amount of fluid being lost um, through the urinary excretion. So those are gonna be the two primary sources of gains and losses for fluid. We are going to be reviewing three important hormones that are gonna be involved in fluid balance. These are ones we've talked about before. This is at least the third chapter where we've discussed these. So we have ADH, which stands, of course, for antidiuretic hormone. We have aldosterone. And then the ANP and BNP in the corner there is our um, abbreviation for the atrial notriuretic peptide or the beta type, or excuse me, B-type notriuretic peptide. So we really just talked about it as notriuretic peptide in the past. Okay, so let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. Antidiuretic hormone is, of course, ADH. It can be released in response to osmotic receptors in the hypothalamus. So if you have a high osmolarity, you're gonna get the release of ADH. Osmolarity, remember, is the solute concentration. So a high osmolarity means that our fluid has a lot of solute, which means it's concentrated. So we need to dilute it out. So antidiuretic will help us do that. Antidiuretic hormone is going to trigger um, faculty of water reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct of the kidney. And this is also going to increase hypothalamic thirst centers. So if you're reabsorbing water at the kidney and you're taking in more fluid, you're diluting out your ECF, which is going to bring your solute concentration or your osmolarity back into normal range. The other thing I didn't say, but you can see here, is that the ADH is um, being released from the neurohypothesis. Okay, the next one to look at is aldosterone. It's kind of a companion to ADH. It's helping um, when our osmolarity is low, in this case. Aldosterone, remember, is a corticosteroid, so it's being released by the adrenal cortex. Now, it's released by a couple signals. So if your potassium levels are high, then aldosterone can be released um, because it's going to help with the secretion of potassium. If your sodium levels are low, then aldosterone is going to be released because it's going to help with the reabsorption of sodium. Or we see this being released, of course, as part of the RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So that's in response to low blood pressure, low blood volume. Aldosterone specifically activates the sodium potassium exchange pumps at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So it's triggering both sodium reabsorption and chloride reabsorption. And this is gonna to help to increase the blood osmolarity, which is gonna help pull water back in. So it's gonna to help to um, increase your blood volume and increase your blood pressure. Again, the key thing here is the water is gonna follow the salt. So if you reabsorb the sodium, then you're gonna be pulling water back in to the blood capillary. And then the last hormone to talk about here is the notriuretic peptide. Remember, it can be atrial uh, notriuretic peptide, ANP, or B-type notriuretic peptide, BNP. Your notriuretic peptide, remember, is released by the heart under response of um, the atrium stretching. So you have atrial stretch receptors. If you have a lot of blood volume, then those atria are gonna get really full and stretch. That will signal the release of the notoritic peptide from the heart. One of the um, responses to ANP is to decrease thirst. We will also see a decrease in the release of the ADH and aldosterone. So you basically stop facultative water reabsorption. You stop the selective reabsorption of sodium. So this is gonna increase your water secretion. Extra fluid is leaving the body. Um, you get that really large amount of dilute urine, and this is gonna to help to reduce your blood volume, your blood pressure, and also reconcentrate or maintain your osmo, um, osmolarity of your body solutions. So what are our possible gains? So we know, of course, the digestive system is an important source of fluid in the body. 
but also your cells are producing some water as a result of metabolism, and that water can also be used to increase the amount of extracellular fluid. Your, gain, your losses then are primarily urinary system, but also as we are exhaling, we have some water vapor that's being lost at the lungs. You also have both insensible and sensible perspiration. So you have some evaporation across the skin all the time. Plus also sweat glands can cause some water secretion. That's of course a variable. And then some water is lost with the feces. Again, in order for us to maintain a fluid balance, the gains have to be equal to the losses. When our gains are not equal to the losses, we do see changes in our osmolarity. So if you have excess water loss, you're basically concentrating your body fluids, so you're increasing your osmolarity. You have more solute and less water in the ECF. The reverse of this is true if you have excess of water gain. So when you have excess water gain, you're again disrupting your osmolarity, but this time you're going to decrease it. You've basically diluted or flooded your body fluids. You have too much water. The initial response will be what's called a fluid shift. So if we look at this example where we have ICF and ECF separated by the um, cell membrane, let's say here that we have an extracellular fluid with a high osmolarity, then based on the principles of osmosis, water is gonna flow from a high water concentration to a low water concentration. So water is going to leave the cell and move into the extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is gonna become more dilute, so that's gonna maintain that osmolarity that we need. And the cell has lost water, so it can dehydrate here. Initially, it's not a big deal. It's not losing a whole lot of water. But of course, if this is continuing to happen, then you can see some significant problems from cells dehydrating. If you have a prolonged serious dehydration, then the sodium concentration is gonna get really high. And we can call that hypernatremia. So we'll be looking at sodium balance here in just a little bit. Also, if you don't have a lot of fluid, you're gonna have a low blood pressure and a low blood volume. Well, this a difference in osmolarity as well as blood volume and blood pressure will trigger the RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which also will trigger the release of the ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So we'll see at the kidney, the um, increase of the facultative water reabsorption as well as the turning on of the sodium potassium exchange pumps so that we're retaining water as well as retaining sodium so that again, water follows sodium. We put more blood, or excuse me, more sodium into the bloodstream and then the water will follow. So we're increasing our blood um, volume and our blood pressure here. The opposite of this is gonna happen if the extracellular fluid is too dilute. So I've just tried to fill it up with a bunch of water there. If you have a low osmolarity in the ECF, water's gonna go from a high water to a low water. So this time it's gonna push into the cell and the cell is going to gain water. Now again, initially this may not be a problem, but cells can only take on so much water before they have the potential for breaking open, which is, of course means death to that cell. So clearly that can be a problem. When we have a decrease in our osmolarity and the extracellular fluid, we're gonna get a decrease in the ADH production. So now we're gonna get rid of that extra water in the kidney. Um, we're also going to see that um, this can be caused for hyper, from hyperhydration, um, which is leading to hyponatremia. So the thing that you should see here is that fluid balance and sodium balance are intimately related because really we're not looking at the total amount of fluid or the total amount of sodium, but rather the osmolarity or the concentration of sodium in those different fluids. If you overhydrate, you are flooding your body with water. You're flooding your body fluids so that the sodium level is too dilute. And this can lead to symptoms that look like somebody who's drunk. So this can be described as water intoxication. It can get serious pretty fast. We already talked about potential for those cells to rupture, um, which can lead to you know, death of cells, obviously, which then can lead to death of the individual. And that's it for now.